Good morning. The hearing board is in session, and uh, we're meeting in the uh, Torrance City Hall Council Chambers. Time is about 9.07 a.m. If there's uh, anyone in the audience uh, who would like to avail themselves of uh, Spanish translation, it is available See, uh, just by finding one of the staff members, and they'll set you up. Servicios de traducción a español están disponibles a favor de ver un miembro del personal. Today, the hearing board will consider a petition for a stipulated order for abatement against Exxon Mobil Oil Corporation in case 1183-494. Who is representing the executive officer this morning? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. Bay Gilcrest representing the district with me here at council table is Deputy Executive Officer Mohsen Nazimi. Thank you. And who's representing respondent ExxonMobil? Good morning, Chairman Camarena, members of the board, Francis Keeler with Clyde & Co. on behalf of ExxonMobil. Thank you. The hearing board normally conducts its hearings in its uh, dedicated hearing room in Diamond Bar uh, during normal business hours, uh, weekday business hours. Today, however, I wish to extend our appreciation to the city of Torrance for their hospitality and assistance in making the council chambers available to us so that we can hold this very important hearing on this date here in the city of Torrance for the convenience of the community. I particularly like to express our appreciation to city manager Leroy Jackson and management associate Eleanor Jones who have coordinated all the permitting with police department, fire department, community development, community relations, public safety, IT and facilities. That's an awful lot of work. I would also like to uh, recognize the untiring efforts of the district public affairs staff in helping to bring this hearing to the community. A few details before we get started. Uh, if you are seated in the overflow area outside and you plan to testify, uh, it may be wise to take a seat inside so you can have quicker access to the microphone when you are called to testify. If you do plan to testify, please notify a member of the district staff. Uh, they're all around the room. Uh, they'll assist you. And um, you will need to fill out a, a yellow request to uh, testify card and hand it to one of the staff <coughs> members. The same is true if you have any written testimony. We do require eight copies. A few more details. Uh, the hearing board is an independent, it, the hearing board is independent of the Air Quality Management District. We are not the district. We are a quasi-judicial body, and this is a judicial proceeding. Uh, it's not a, a workshop or a rally of any kind. Today we will be considering a very narrow issue, the proposed, the stipulated order for abatement petition that is before us. I'd like to turn the mic over to uh, Ms. Julie Prusak, our legal member on this board, who will more fully describe who we are, what our authority is, and how you members of the public may participate in today's hearing. Ms. Prusak. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as the chairman was stating, we are here today to hear a petition that has uh, been brought before us uh, for a stipulated order for abatement against ExxonMobil. Um, we're also here today in the community to allow you, the interested members of the public, an opportunity to testify um, with regard to the petition for stipulated order for abatement that we are considering. And as the chairman also mentioned, this five-member hearing board that you see before you is not part of the South Coast Air Quality Management District. We are separate. We are independent. We are a quasi-judicial body. The hearing board was established by state law. It's, comp it's comprised of, <clears throat> excuse me, one medical member, one attorney, one engineer, and two general public members who have special expertise and are knowledgeable in air pollution control issues. This hearing board is authorized by state law to, among other things, issue orders for abatement. 
An order for abatement can require a company to take appropriate measures to stop violations of the air pollution rules and regulations or to shut down the offending operation. An order for abatement has the force of law and it can be enforced by court order. Today, we are considering what is called a stipulated order for abatement against ExxonMobil. And this means that the District Council and ExxonMobil attorneys and the parties have gotten together and agreed to an order that both parties feel will allow the refinery to start up again with conditions to offset any impact on the environment and the public. It's our, job to it's our job today to determine whether the parties and you, as members of the affected public, present enough evidence to establish that we have good cause to grant the order. Now, in determining good cause, we consider all the relevant evidence and factors, including evidence of any alleged violations, the alleged sources of these violations at the facility, whether the conditions of the proposed order will bring the facility into compliance with all applicable rules, and how quickly that can occur. Now, to grant a stipulated order, we do not have to find today that there are any actual violations. This hearing is likely to be different than any government hearing you may have attended before unless you've attended any of our hearing board meetings or hearings. This is more like a court proceeding than a rulemaking or other administrative proceeding. And that's important to know when you make your comments today. And first and foremost, you will be making your comments under oath. We invite every person here to address the board today. And ultimately, though, we are constrained to consider in our deliberations only that testimony which is relevant to the issues in this case. So keep a few things in mind. Please speak only from your own personal experience and knowledge. Also, please pay attention to the openings and presentations of the parties um, and the plan for compliance. If you haven't seen a copy, I assume they are available. Um, so you can comment specifically on that plan from your own knowledge and experience. And finally, keep in mind that the most relevant evidence will concern specific alleged rules violations in the petition and relate only to re the restart of the refinery. And we can't address anything else today. So please contain your comments to the three-minute time limit for individuals and five-minute time limit if you represent a group. Um, you cannot borrow from another person, and we will be strictly enforcing those limits today. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Ms. Prusak. Your Mayor, um, Mr. Patrick J. Fury, would like to say a few words before we get started. After the mayor, I will give um, any elected official who would like to speak an opportunity in order to get through the day today. However, I'm going to ask everyone to limit their uh, presentations, uh, elected officials. Uh, if you can limit it to five minutes, that would be nice. Uh, and um, we had planned to allow three minutes uh, for each member of the public to speak. However, because of the large number that we have today, and in order to get through, we're going to have to limit um, public members to two minutes, and the total time will also be limited. Um, and, okay. Mayor Fury. Good morning, Mr. Chair, board members, and staff of the South Coast AQMD. I am Torrance Mayor Patrick Fury, and on behalf of my Colleagues on the City Council and my city staff, I welcome you to the City of Torrance. On behalf of our community, I thank you for conducting this hearing in our city for the convenience of all affected. Before you get started, I would like to make a brief statement. The February 2015 ExxonMobil Torrance refinery explosion and the subsequent incidents have been an eye-opener for our city. We are keenly aware of the concerns of our community and we share many of those concerns. With the safety of our community, a priority following the February 2015 incident, we initiated meetings with refinery officials and safety experts numerous times seeking explanations and collecting up-to-date information on all, all the incidents. During frequent meetings with Brian Ablatt, the general manager of ExxonMobil Torrance, we discussed the February 2015 and subsequent incidents and steps necessary to restart the refinery on a number of occasions. We have also met with Mr. Jeffrey Dill, the Western Region 
president of PBF Energy, the proposed purchaser of the refinery, also discussing the safety concerns at the refinery. In summary, the city has taken the following actions to date. In March 2015, we met with Chemical Safety Board Chairperson Rafael More Arraso and his team to ensure the Chemical Board's goal was a comprehensive investigation to determine the cause of the incidents and what could be done to avoid a reoccurrence. We committed to work together to ensure the safety of the Tarns community, and we were advised that it could take up to 18 months before a determination of cause by that body would be made and that we would be kept up to date on the findings. To keep the public informed and the lines of communications open, the community was invited to voice their concerns at a public workshop conducted by the City Council in June of 2015. ExxonMobil officials were in attendance to explain the status of the refinery at that time and exactly what safety measures had been put into place or were being put into place. In October 2015, we had a phone conference with the current chairperson of the Chemical Safety Board, Ms. Vanessa Sutherland, and her team discussing the Chemical Safety Board concerns and approaches to remedy them. In November 2015, we met with Chemical Safety Board investigator Mark Weingard and Chemical Safety Board attorney advisor Jared Denton, again discussing the, the procedure and what was occurring. The city provided the CBS with documentation and direction as to where additional information could be obtained by that body. On January 13, 2016, the Chemical Safety Board conducted a public hearing right here in our chambers to address the concerns or hear the concerns from our residents and other affected parties. With regard to some misconceptions that have been reported in the media, I have stated and restated and I stated again that the Tarn City Council has always been advised of any implementation of modified hydrofluoric acid. Since the incident, we have developed an informational page on tarnca.gov, our website, that the community can access by typing ExxonMobil in the search engine. The web page contains information we have gathered on recent incidents thus far and links visitors to authority websites and displays upcoming meetings. The city, state, federal, and regional authorities have and are working towards our shared goal to keep Tarrants, its residents, visitors, and business communities safe. Given that the Chemical Safety Board has identified areas of concern, the City Council is awaiting to hear from the Chemical Safety Board to immediately improve the safety of the refinery. It should be noted that the City is working collaboratively with the South Coast Air Quality Management District to evaluate modified hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen, hydrofluoric acid versus other feasible catalytic methodologies with an estimated timeline of four to six months. Lastly, we are very pleased that the South Coast Air Quality Management District Board is having the hearing in, it, in our city to facilitate availability for all of our citizens. I want to thank you very much for being here today and look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Hadley. Terrific. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, staff, and most importantly, residents of Torrance and the South Bay, uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, my name is David Hadley, H-A-D-L-E-Y, and I'm proud to represent Torrance and uh, most of the South Bay in the California State Assembly, and, uh, and I have taken the oath this morning. Um, I am not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. Uh, most of the people in this room are not engineers or scientists. Uh, what we can do is we can, we can study what we've been informed of and we can try to use our common sense and we can try to judge the actions that we do understand. And, uh, and too many of the actions in this case have been hard for the public, uh, hard for the residents of Torrance, hard for me to understand. Um, the, when the explosion took place in February of 2015, uh, the response in the community, to the community, the information that was received by the community about the explosion and about our, our public safety response to this explosion was incomplete. It was late. 
residents were not informed. Uh, I think that it was hard to imagine for many of us in Torrance and in the South Bay that you know, one of the largest companies in the world, one of the largest private sector companies in the world uh, operating a, a dangerous asset in a crowded urban area didn't have really a well-functioning communication response system in place. And that leads all of us, of course, to fear what else we don't know about the safety of the operation. We have, my office and I have been consulting extensively with stakeholders on this matter since February of 2015. Uh, but the managements of both ExxonMobil and PBF, uh, the Torrance Refinery Action Alliance, homeowner associations around Torrance, organized labor representing the workers who would be the first to be harmed in an incident, uh, another incident here at the refinery, uh, as well as concerned members of the public. And this is obviously a complicated issue, but we only argue from what we understand. And the response after the explosion in February was hard for the public and for me to understand. And this proceeding has also been hard for many of us to understand uh, where the, the preliminary agreement has been released and announced before this public hearing has taken place. We have, as you can see today, we have hundreds of concerned residents who are here to express their views and share their information about living in proximity to this refinery. Uh, for, for the preliminary agreement to have been uh, put in the public record before hearing from this public in Torrance is also hard for us to understand and to make sense of. And we are here, we hope, we'll, we, hope we will receive significant answers today. Uh, this community is not going away. I personally, speaking for myself, I won't speak for everybody here, I want this refinery to operate. I want this refinery to provide the service that it operates, that it delivers to the community and to the state of California. But obviously, I also want it to be safe for the workers, the, the workers and contractors who are on site, as well as for the surrounding community. Uh, and when an agreement is stipulated before this public hearing, we wonder about the agenda of the parties in play. And we hope that the residents uh, the concerned citizens who are here today will be heard and that our concerns will be reflected in whatever decision the AQMD ultimately makes. We know this is not the only regulatory proceeding in place. We're not going away. We're going to follow this one and other proceedings related to this refinery very closely. So thank you for being here. And I just urge you, please, to listen to the residents who are here today and the experiences they're having. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Assemblyman Hadley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Al Marasucci, and for the record, I am the former assembly member representing the South Bay, as well as a former school board member. I am here because my number one concern is the protection of our families, our neighborhoods, and our children. On the day of the explosion, in February of 2015, I, le I lived less than two miles from the refinery. I saw the white dust falling in my neighborhood. And since then, the Torrance community has seen a constant drumbeat of information related to violations, starting with the hydrofluoric acid the workplace safety violations, the willful workplace safety violations found by state regulators, the findings of the federal regulators, the U.S. Chemical Safety Board, related to the concerns of the refinery. There is a crisis of confidence with the ExxonMobil refinery. And I am most concerned about, I know the subject matter of today's hearing is focusing on the order for abatement as it relates to the allowance of emissions, the, the emissions of toxins into our air, into our surrounding neighborhoods and community. I 
also want to make clear that I am not calling for shutting down the refinery. I know that this room is full of ExxonMobil refinery employees. We are not talking about eliminating their jobs. But what we are talking about is to make sure that we are protecting our children, our families, our community. And I ask you to listen to all the testimony and to listen to where the people are coming from, whether they're employees or whether they're parents, residents, community members. Because again, we are asking you to protect our community. Thank you very much. My name is Hamilton Cloud, and I am Director of Special Projects for Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And I have uh, taken the, uh, the swearing in. Congresswoman Waters would have been here today to deliver this statement herself, but her schedule required her to be out of town. This is her statement. Esteemed members of the board, I have heard from many of my constituents who live in the area surrounding ExxonMobil's Torrance refinery that they have serious conditions about the reported agreement between ExxonMobil and the South Coast Air Quality Management District, which would allow ExxonMobil to restart the refinery's fluid catalytic cracking unit. While I understand that this agreement is just being officially released to the public, it has nevertheless been reported by various media. The proposed agreement allows ExxonMobil to significantly exceed pollution limits at the refinery, and it consequently jeopardizes the health and safety of residents of the surrounding community. The agreement's findings of fact section states that ExxonMobil's plans to restart the unit will violate numerous AQMD rules and permit conditions. According to finding of fact number 30, these violations will result in unmitigated excess emissions in the amounts of 143 pounds of nitrogen oxides, 144 pounds of carbon monoxide, 848 pounds of particulate matter, and 224 pounds of PM10 particulate matter. I question the wisdom of any agreement that would allow emissions in excess of legal limits. My constituents want to be reassured by the AQMD that the air they breathe and the air their children breathe every day is not going to harm them. I am also concerned that local officials and residents have not had sufficient opportunity to examine this agreement and provide informed comments. I therefore join with the residents of the community to urge the hearing board of the South Coast AQMD not to make any decision on this agreement today. Furthermore, I urge the AQMD to require ExxonMobil to comply with all applicable laws and regulations for the good of the community. I understand the concerns about the daily loss of revenues and the possible loss of jobs at ExxonMobil if the company is not able to restart the refinery's FCCU. However, we must always err on the side of safety. The cost of not restarting the FCCU under these proposed conditions pale in comparison to the potential risks to the health and safety of the South Bay. Thank you. I have a question. Mr. Olsman has a question for you. Um, sir, uh, do you know if anyone made Congresswoman Waters aware that the proposed agreement that we're considering today uh, was posted on the district's website, has been for the past couple of days, and was accessible publicly that way? Yes, but she uh, considered that not an adequate way of uh, presenting it to the public. I understand. Thank and, you. And she felt that two or three days of advance notice was not adequate for people to really examine it and, and develop opinions uh, about the effect it's going to have on the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maureen Malk, uh, City Commissioner, City of Torrance. Hello, my name is Maureen Malk, M-A-U-K, and I have taken the oath. Thank you for allowing us to speak today. I'm here as a City of Torrance Commissioner, a member of ExxonMobil's Community Advisory Panel for the past two years, a mom to a one and three year old living a mile away. 
And I also stand here today as a representative of a network of over a thousand South Bay moms who could not attend today's hearing given the needs and schedules of their children. I've submitted this document to you detailing many of their personal responses and concerns for your review. First, I'd like to request a continuance to this hearing as so much of the information was only made public over the past three days. I'm still awaiting information requests myself and was told yesterday afternoon by one of the lab assistants at the AQMD that they can't remove the redactions and the person who has all of the data is on vacation. How can we be asked to turn around our thoughts when the AQMD can't even turn around the information? I ask that you give community members time to review all of the facts in this potentially life-altering choice so that no one is getting backed into a corner by ExxonMobil. Their negligence led to the blast, and yes, they are losing money each day they're not operating, and they're threatening their workers' jobs. But bottom line profits should not come at the expense of worker, community, and environmental health. But even with the limited amount of time and information we've had, here are some of the things that we need. One, ample notification by ExxonMobil prior to all emissions outbursts and flaring so that citizens and schools have the opportunity to seek shelter, evacuate, and relocate. Two, vouchers or reimbursement by ExxonMobil for our relocation and full communication of that reimbursement to area residents, hospitals, and elderly facilities. Three, air quality monitors on the fence line surrounding ExxonMobil with real-time data as was done in the Vernon Exide case. Four, full disclosure, past, present, and future of all emissions data from the stacks per the Title V permits. And finally, because it's not Ex ExxonMobil workers versus the tree huggers, I, we stand here today to request that ExxonMobil provide hazardous duty pay for all the refinery workers as they will be at ground zero working amidst the noxious emissions for protracted amounts of time. Street sweeping twice a day is not enough to protect those workers. Also, reviewing ExxonMobil's pr proposed startup conditions, on number 14, ExxonMobil should notify the district at their 1-800 number within 30 minutes of any odor complaints from the public. Why is the onus on the neighbors to be the watchdogs? What happens when the refinery chooses to open the floodgates in the dark of the night? Where is the logic? It reeks of regulatory capture. Number 21 of the proposed startup conditions. Emissions data reported seven days after completion. Seven days after everyone has breathed that air pollution. This raises a question of how we measure the quality of air here in the South Bay. How could we review the results of the refinery's unmitigated air pollution, given that the closest air monitoring stations are in Compton and Long Beach currently? Accountability. Why should we trust ExxonMobil and empower their flagrant request to blow unmitigated air pollution over the South Bay so they can get fully operational again and complete their sale to PBF? If a measure of society is how we treat our most vulnerable, there is no more clear expression of failure than what seems to be happening at the refinery. As a, one of the mothers who contributed to that document puts it, it is unethical to take away a mother's right to keep her children safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Craig Lehos, HOS, looks like a BE, Oceanside, uh, Ocean Club Apartment, Redondo Beach, followed by Joe Carson, followed by Greg Diamond. Hello, I'm Craig LaHost. It's L apostrophe H O S T E. Thank you. I'm a retiree of ExxonMobil. Oh, one other instruction. Uh, when you come up, spell your name, uh, state it, spell it, and then indicate for the audio record whether or not you took the oath. When you yes, I've taken the oath. Okay. And when you finish that, then your the clock starts on you. Go. Okay, I think I'm ready to go. <laughs> I, uh, I work at the Torrance Refinery. I think that it's one of the safest places I've ever worked. Torrance has a commitment to safety, to the well-being of this refinery, and they're second to none. 
Now, I know that's my opinion, but I can tell you this. I go to meetings every day, and we always start with safety, environmental, and environment, right? We always consider what's going on in the community. That's number one, before we talk about any business we have in the, in the refinery itself. No work takes place in that refinery without us talking about it first, without going over the job. It's always commitment to safety, and that's what we do. I know that's my personal opinion, but I know there's a lot of people in this room that feel just like I do. And if you'd stand up and show your support, I'd appreciate that if you work there. Thank you. Joe Carson, Greg Diamond, Sam Hepner. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Carson, C-A-R-S-O-N, and I have taken the oath. I'm a resident of the South Bay. I'm also uh, an engineer at the refinery where I've worked for over 26 years. But in addition to that, I'm a husband whose wife works on Crenshaw Boulevard over there. And I'm a father whose son goes to elementary school about two miles from the refinery. There's been a lot of question as about is the FCC safe to restart? I can tell you without a doubt that it is. I've been personally involved with the training and the procedures that Mr. Ingram referred to earlier in detail. You know, the people at our plant and myself, we're very proud of being part of our own community in the refinery, as well as the Torrance community. The refinery and the city, they're my home. It's where I spend most of my time during the workday. In fact, my wife will tell you I spend more time at work than I do at home on the weekday. On the weekends, what do I do? My son and I, we go to soccer games on the soccer fields nearby. We uh, go bike riding to Columbia Park. We volunteer at the Madrona Marsh. As I said, this is our home. And I will assure you that my coworkers and I are fully committed to the safe operation of the plant, as well as the safety and health of the greater Torrance community. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Diamond, Sam Hepner, Thomas Gibson. Hi, uh, Greg Diamond, spelled like diamond ring. I'm an employee at the refinery, and uh, my wife and I live over down the beach. On the way here, my wife asked, what is this order of abatement? Anyway, it doesn't sound too good. I said, well, it depends on what you're abating, because abatement means to reduce something, to lessen it, in some context, to end it altogether. And I can think of a number of things I'd like to see the board abate today, if possible. Uh, just five things come readily to mind. The first is I'd like to see the board abate the risk of the loss of jobs at the refinery. We have 550 employees at the refinery, 550 contractors, and the 1,100 people there have been very busy the past year getting the place repaired, doing a major turnaround. But at this point, there's nothing left to do except run the refinery and make gasoline. So we're either going to do that or we're not. And if we're not, the jobs are at risk. The board can abate that risk. Second thing, very quickly, the loss of tax revenue for the city of Torrance. It could go for parks, uh, social services, uh, any number of things, infrastructure. That tax stream has been absent for the past year. The board can abate that loss of tax revenue. Third thing is the loss of uh, untold millions of dollars by the part of Southern California Motors who are paying higher gasoline prices for the past year. Unnecessary now that the refinery is ready to run again. The board can abate that loss. The fourth thing, the board can abate the undue, unnecessary, counterproductive politicization of this entire series of events over the past 13 months. Not on the part of every citizen, but some citizens. Not on the part of every agency, but some agencies. And the loss, I hope the board can abate that risk. The last thing I'll mention, 20 seconds left, all of us as employees are a little bit frustrated right now. We've heard from the SQMD SQMD staff, they're very competent. Uh, I've listened very carefully to the testimony. I'm an English major. It sounds to me like they know what they're talking about. So we're all frustrated. We feel like a little bit like Al Pacino in the movie Scent of a Woman as he's addressing the disciplinary committee at the end of the film. That's how we feel right now. I hope the board abates our frustration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask that you, you please refrain from uh, applauding or any cheering. This is not a pep rally or workshop. Uh, Mr. Sam Hepner, or Hepner, Thomas Gibson, 
Daniel Juarez. Hi, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Sam, S-A-M, Hepner, H-E-P-N-E-R. I am a supervisor at ExxonMobil Torrance Refinery, employee of 34 years. I'm also a father uh, that has children attend Torrance schools, Walteria specifically, and J.H. Hall. And uh, I've also uh, been exper experienced in the FCC unit and alkylation units. I, I carry many hats. I also work with AQMD inspectors when they show up at the plant. And, uh, you know, we are safer than we've ever been. I've been there since 1980. And I've seen enormous investment by the company in growth in the precipitators. The precipitator is like three, four times the size of what it is now. I see the interlock systems that they put in is fantastic. And I tell you what, the resolve of my teammates, my family members, at Torrance Refinery is there to protect the community and public and run safely and make some gasoline. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Sir Thomas Gibson, Daniel, Daniel Juarez, Sherry Lear. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Gibson, last name is Gibson, G-I-B-S-O-N, and I did take the oath. I would like to say, um, I mean, I am an Exxon employee. I work at the Torrance Refinery. I've been there 26 years. I started off in the trenches um, as a, an assistant, and I currently work my way up to uh, refinery superintendent. So I am the one who acts as a refinery manager in the off shift and weekends. And uh, as though I'm not a member or a resident of Torrance, I kind of feel like I am. I'm at that refinery all the time. I probably spend more time in Torrance than an actual Torrance resident. Um, we are committed to safety. You have my word, all policies will be followed, all procedures will be followed. And if this abatement order is granted, we will follow everything in, a, in that abatement and we will start up so flawlessly, one time, and safely. And I would appreciate your blessing and your approval to start up to give our family back stability, peace, and a peace of mind that we can get back on with our lives and just... We understand we're in the middle of a residential neighborhood. I know that more than the residents. Trust me, it's on my mind 24-7 when I'm at work. And I appreciate your blessing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Daniel Juarez, Sherry Lear, Gurgum Ng. Uh, hi, I'm Geng Maneng, uh, 5215 Lenore Street, Torrance, California, last name spelled E-N-G, and I did take the oath. Okay, before your time starts, I want to say something. Mr. Eng has uh, provided uh, the hearing board with a citizen petition for additional enforcement actions, which we have marked as exhibit, uh, num a public exhibit number one. I was just handed another document. Uh, it's an addendum to the petition, uh, so I'm going to mark it as Public Exhibit 1A, and uh, I believe, Mr. Eng, that uh, many of the questions you raised in the initial petition have been addressed, so you may have four minutes. Oh, thank you very much. I, I probably won't need most of uh, the four minutes, but um, the... Uh, uh, and the major concern uh, is two things. One is that the Chemical Safety Board is going to finish their uh, work and figure out why uh, the explosion happened in the first place. And so I think there's going to be mitigation of the explosion, and it's uh, not clear to me that uh, the refinery should be given the boon of this extra pollution where uh, I would have expected that after the explosion they would bring the refinery up to a um, even better than ever uh, situation where they could operate everything absolutely normally uh, and cure all the possible uh, root causes and have all the corrective actions uh, for that explosion so that it would never happen again with all sorts of conditions. Instead, what I see here is that they have taken a 
uh, a route which says, no, give us uh, an ability to pollute a lot more uh, because that is a maybe an easier way to uh, enhance the safety, uh, whereas the difficult but long-term safe, safer route would be to uh, complete and let all the uh, government agencies complete their analysis of the uh, explosion itself instead of uh, tying the explosion to say, oh, we still think there's a risk of explosion that we want to mitigate with extra pollution. I would have hoped they would have instead say, we're going to mitigate it by doing all these extra controls, systems, training, uh, extra valves, redundancy, uh, things like that. And so that's why I think it's actually premature and uh, unnecessary to give them this pollution uh, boon. Uh, and then it may be unsafe in the long run, uh, including for the successors in the refinery, because uh, the, uh, uh, the, the extra uh, controls will not have been put in place. Uh, in the addendum, I was worried a little bit about the language uh, and, and, of course, the missing page I noted. But um, the whole point is that when uh, a, somebody says, may I violate uh, the rules, it's one thing. When you say, you may violate the rules, I'm very concerned that they're going to exceed their permit values. So what happens? How far up can that go? And I see no method, uh, methodology to set those limits. Uh, and there's two things. One, of course, is the public safety. And the second thing is, at what point, if something goes weird, should they then be forced to say, no, we're just going to shut down. There are numerous places in there where it says, we're going to run this under these conditions, those conditions, more permit conditions. But if they're violated, uh, it seems they're just going to be able to pray that it'll all work out instead of uh, saying, no, uh, you know, this might not be good. Maybe we should shut it back down and think about what we're doing. So I, would, I had hoped that the board would have these extra limits uh, above and beyond, and I don't see that. Um, and so that's a lot of the uh, ideas. Uh, I'm worried about uh, how much opacity there is, what's in there besides just its, its optical properties, and what about what even you can't see it at night, and what it's made out of. And lastly, uh, on the uh, idea, we're not for uh, saying that the FCCU should never be restarted, which would result in all the loss of jobs, but just that it should be uh, held off a little bit more uh, to wait for all these other things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ng. Sherry Lear, uh, Lenore Hodges, Catherine um, L-E-Y-S Lees. Okay. Hi, my name is Sherry Lear. I'm a business owner in the city of Torrance. Um, I also have a son who attends Torrance schools, and I'm also here on behalf of, I'm an attorney have a, on behalf of a client of mine, Airlax, which has a business operating on 208th and Crenshaw, so they're very close to the refinery. They've asked me to come here today to represent um, that business as well. Um, as a business owner and, and an attorney, I am, and a mother who has this child in Torn Schools, I am concerned um, about the restart of the FC, FC, CCU under the proposed uh, conditions because it will amount in excess emissions. Um, this isn't an issue of, hate, of safety per se as much as it is public health concerns. Um, I am very glad to hear that the number of hours that the ESP unit will be off has been reduced from 48 to 6 hours. Um, but even during this time, science tells us that uh, short-term exposure to uh, NOx, um, and we're talking about 12-hour exposure, can be very damaging to someone's health. We're also going to have a very large amount of uh, particulate matter that is going to be you know, introduced into our air and some very small particulates which can enter people's lungs. Um, my son suffers from exercise-induced asthma. So I'm concerned if this goes on when he's outside um, playing volleyball or whatever at his school that this could be a danger. Um, at the very least, I would ask that that six-hour period when the ESP um, be off uh, be limited to hours outside of school and outside of regular business operations. Um, the mitigation matters are, you know, the fact that the NOx emissions are mostly going to be offset by credits means that we're still all going to be breathing this. So um, I'm not real happy to see that. I understand the, the why cap and trade exists, but in this particular case, it's not stopping 
my family and other people that I know and love and care about from breathing NOx emissions, which are very serious. So with that, I just want to thank you um, for, your, for your time and for your efforts on this. And uh, know that there are a lot of businesses, not just ExxonMobil and Torrance, and a lot of them are very concerned about the numerous events that have happened at this refinery, including a very recent and extended flaring event caused by a Mylar balloon causing a power outage. So there's a lot of concern. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lear. Lenore Hodges, Catherine Elias, I think, Edward Hart. Hello, my name is Lenore Hodges, H-O-D-G-E-S, and I did take the oath. My husband and I both grew up in the city of Torrance. We met in high school. We dated. We followed his grandfather, Thomas Gibson, Tommy's grandfather as well, into the refinery work. My husband started in 1978. I started in 1979. Of my five children, two of them work there. My daughter's been there 11 years, and my son just started there. I feel that when they're traveling to work on the roads in Torrance and even in the community with the crime, they're more adapt to getting hurt than they are at the refinery. I feel safe when I know they get there, and I, I adhere to everyone's comments about the safety culture in the refinery. And I hope that the, the criticism we get from the groups, from the media, um, does not reflect, and, and it felt threatening to me, and I hope that you don't think that as a threat in your decisions with the Torrance Refinery. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Lays, or Edward Hart, Mike Bullock. Hi, my name is Catherine Lays, L-E-Y-S, and I've taken the oath. First off, I'm a proud Torrance resident. I live in the South Bay area of Torrance with my husband and my children who are ages three and four. I respect the hard work that goes on in the refineries. I respect the jobs that they provide. And I also respect the sense of the loyalty that uh, employees must feel. That said, following the 2015 refinery explosion, which rained ash on our town, ash that my children referred to as snow at the neighborhood park, I've become increasingly concerned with the lack of communication during and after emergency events, lack of transparency following events, and the overall upkeep of the Torrance refinery. There seems to be a disconnect where an Exxon operates as though it's located on an isolated island as, instead of as inside a densely populated community. At minimum, the restart should be delayed as the community has not had time to consider the deal. After looking at the 17-page order, I have the following concerns. One, Exxon is required to notify the district at their 800 number within 30 minutes of any visible emissions or odor complaints from the public. Again, why is it that we're being required to be the watchdogs in this? Shouldn't they be required to install equipment to monitor their own emissions? Two, the refinery is required to submit various emissions ejection data seven days after the completion of startup. Again, what information does this, how good does this, uh, what good does this information do to the public? I mean, how can we avoid exposure if it's provided seven days after the fact? Three, I'm interested to know if workers at the refiner will be offered hazard pay during the startup period, or if additional precautions will be taken to ensure that their own exposure to emissions is minimized. Four, I don't fully understand when we're, rec when we're um, referring to air quality standards historically, which monitors that are available to the public that we're referring to, because I only know of two, those located in Long Beach and in Compton. If the decision is not delayed, the board should demand transparency and safety by requiring air quality monitors on the fence line by requiring real-time available data. And lastly, even if overall emission standards fall within the overall LA Basin total EPA air quality standards, this does not mean that our kids, our families, and our most vulnerable who reside, learn, and play in the surrounding refinery should have to bear the brunt and breathe 200, 632 pounds of PM 2.5. Please add startup conditions to relocate the area's schools and residents during these six to 10 hours. Thank you. Thank you. Edward Hart, Mike Bullock, Rafael Anguano. My name is Edward Hart. I'm a, I've taken the oath, H-A-R-T. I'm a unit operator at the refinery. Let me start by stating I have great respect for Mr. Nazimi. I've met with him a few times in the field, and his questions were very intelligent and several enlightening. I enjoyed conversation with him, and as you have found, he has a sense of humor. I've met with uh, AQMD field auditors and inspectors on several of their regular audits, and they too have been professional, intelligent, and thorough. We try with great diligence to comply with our permits, regulations, and policies. If they find something, I'm very embarrassed. I've worked for various employers for the past 43 years, 
and the people I work with here at Torrance are the best I've ever worked with. I wish um, all of our Torrance neighbors at the refinery were here at this meeting. Uh, let me explain. There's a safety flare at the Port of Long Beach that lit off one afternoon very noisily and scared a few of my neighbors. None of my neighbors knew what it was for. It's out over the water. So I still don't know what it's for. Um, you brought up that our ESPs are just seven years old, our big new beautiful boxes, the ones we just rebuilt and blew up. Um, we didn't have those before seven years ago, so whatever this permit's about is probably related to better clean air right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mike Bullock, Rafael, and uh, James William. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Bullock, last name B-U-L-L-O-C-K. Um, First, I want to object to the first gentleman that talked. He stated that there were a lot of people here with concerns. Actually, most of the people here you saw were in support of the restart of the uh, FCC unit at the Torrance Refinery. And you just saw that again by people standing up. So um, along with most of the people in this room that support the restart of the Torrance F Refinery's FCC and its associated ESP in the safest possible manner, which is shutting down the power to the ESP for a very short period of time during the unit startup while torch oil is in. Our detractors, who are determined to excite the public in any way possible by making outlandish claims, want to make it sound like the ESP will not be operating for days during the, entire, during the entire startup period, which we know is not true now. One thing I want to point out is during the past year, the refinery has not only repaired damaged equipment, but it's taken the opportunity to upgrade other equipment within the refinery to reduce emissions. I didn't realize this was all going to be a part of testimony, but the first thing that came to mind was the um, cooling tower uh, drift reducers. Um, that's the one thing I'm specifically thinking of, but there's been many more. Um, this means that after the restart and running at full capacity, the emissions from the refinery are going to be permanently lower. This just isn't a temporary mitigation, but they'll be permanently lower. Um, that's going to be a bonus for everybody. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Rafael Angiano, James William, Stephen Goldsmith. Good afternoon, Chairman Camarena, honorable uh, panelists. My name is Rafael Anguiano, A-N-G-U-I-A-N-O. I'm a resident of the South Bay. I'm a 14-year operator in the Coker unit at the refinery. I want to make one thing very clear. I would like to reaffirm some of the comments that Mr. Inger made today about the preparation that the process operators undergo during every single shutdown in every single startup. This isn't a new thing, but this is something that we've done on an enhanced level to ensure that the operators on the ground level understand every single move and the significance and the impact. That is not lost in everything that has been said here today. I understand that some of the residents feel a concern about our general welfare. We are extremely highly trained and well-paid individuals. We have personal protection equipment that is issued to us. We're highly trained. Most of us are on our fire department. I'm a lieutenant on that fire department. I'm also hazmat trained. So we're prepared. This last week we went with joint training with the Torrance Fire Department to ensure that they were aware of the level of expertise and the level of commitment that we share to this community. We are held accountable for our actions, and we will continue to strive to ensure that we have a flawless, safe, one-time startup. And I submit that statement to you for your consideration, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. James William, Stephen Goldsmith, D. Kelly Sundberg. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Goldsmith, G-O-L-D-S-M-I-T-H, and uh, I'm a resident and I have taken the oath. Um, I'm a member of the Torrance Refinery Action Alliance, but I, my statement is my individual uh, point of view. And I was rained on uh, on February 18th um, for the ash, and that's kind of what motivated me to get involved. I um, was a member of the United Steelworkers for 10 years, working in a steel mill where every day they said safety first, and yet during the time I was there, 13 people died. Um, and um, I uh, 
have utmost respect and confidence in the employees of the refinery to and, and nobody in the TRAA questions their ability to really operate totally safely and, and flawlessly. Um, the issue is the construction of the uh, facility itself. Um, and the, the, I was kind of shocked to see it's been rebuilt in exactly, not exactly, but largely the same when the CSB recommended a physical barrier instead of steam to protect against hydrocarbons. And nowhere on that chart that I can see, uh, it's hard for me to see it, but is the mention of the tank of uh, large quantity of hydrofluoric acid. And uh, I heard nothing that said there had been re in the rebuilding uh, whether that, that there was protection put in. Um, I disturbed that the, uh, the owners of uh, ExxonMobil have not uh, complied with the um, subpoenas of the CSB and I don't think uh, this body should act until you get all of that information. Um, and I think that the um, real question is whether things like, not the employee's uh, ability, but things like is the plant built to protect against uh, earthquakes, um, a plane crash, if someone just landed on the freeway. What if one landed in the middle of the, uh, th you know, things beyond what we expect. And I think the um, people in Fukushima never expected that, that to happen here to them, and we don't expect it to happen here, but we sure don't want uh, thousands of people killed because of hydrofluoric acid not being uh, contained. Thank you very much. Okay, we have... Uh, James William, D. Kelly Sundberg, Jim Tarr. Anybody? Thank you for allowing us to have a chance to talk. My name is Kelly Sundberg, last name S-U-N-D-B-E-R-G, and I did take the oath. My name is Kelly Senberg. My husband Mark and I have worked at the Torrance Refinery as contractors for a WTMC for about 10 years. We work in the turnaround group, the group, the division that does the extensive shutdown work to ensure that the refinery is repaired and in working order during large maintenance projects and prior to the startup of the refinery. I am very proud to work in such a positive, with such a positive group of people and in the safe culture at that refinery. And that culture starts at the top with management and goes all the way down to the little people. And uh, my husband and I have five children and several, ten grandchildren. And if we felt that our lives were in danger, we would not work at the refinery. And I can assure you that I would not stand here in front of the board and the community and ask that the refinery be allowed to start up as planned. As a fellow human being with a conscious heart and a genuine concern for others' health and well-being, I would not work in an environment that would deliberately and deceitfully put the lives of anyone, employees, families, or businesses in the community in danger. I value my own life as well as the lives of others, and I feel safe in this refinery, and I can, with clear conscience, ask that you guys support the startup of the refinery. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Tarr, <coughs> Melanie Cohen. Sally Hayati. Uh, my name is Jim Tarr, and I've been sworn, and I've also been asked to speak on behalf of TRAA. So I want to confirm that I have four minutes versus two minutes. You have four minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Tarr. I'm the president of Stone Alliance Environmental. I've been involved in air pollution evaluation projects since May 5, 1972. I'm also a longtime Exxon Mobil shareholder. And with all due respect to the employees of Exxon who are very concerned about this, as they should be, I think it makes sense to put a little perspective into the situation that we're talking about. As a result of their ex explosion investigation, Cal OSHA found that Exxon Mobil did not take action to eliminate known hazardous conditions at their refinery and intentionally failed to comply with state safety standards. ExxonMobil apparently knew about flammable vapor leakage into their ESP as far back as 2007, which is in fact at least some of the reason why this explosion occurred and why we're here today. My primary concern relates to hydrogen cyanide. 
we know that the FCCU is an emission source for hydrogen cyanide in the atmosphere. It's clear that the approach that ExxonMobil is going to take, as represented here today, is going to change the emission rate of hydrogen cyanide in the atmosphere. It's not clear to me whether that emission rate is going to go up or down, but it is clear to me that a toxic chemical that's killed hundreds of thousands of people needs to be thoroughly understood in the context of what we're talking about. It's also clear to me that it is not understood. I have several recommendations to make, starting with, without qualification, I recommend that you deny ExxonMobil's request and that instead you require that ExxonMobil replace their ESP with a state of art with a state-of-the-art wet scrubber, and please note that it's difficult to blow up a wet scrubber, and that those devices are used to control air emissions from a number of FCC use throughout the United States. If you decide to grant ExxonMobil's request, I recommend that you include a provision that would require ExxonMobil to terminate their startup at six hours and one second if they cannot energize the electrostatic precipitator after that period of time. Finally, I recommend that for future considerations that the South Coast AQMD provide to the public their engineering evaluations, air dispersion modeling, health impact effects, studies that they've done that represent the position that they're taking in a situation like that. If, in fact, they decide to do that, then everyone involved in this kind of thing is going to have more credibility. That's basically it. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. I do have a question, Mr. Tarr. Um, you mentioned that uh, there are wet scrubbers used elsewhere to control uh, particulate matter? That's correct. You know what the efficiency of those wet scrubbers is compared to the ESPs? Well, it, it depends on the on the situation at hand uh, and a lot of other things. But the state-of-the-art wet scrubber, in all probability, is going to be equal to or greater than the, or going to have an equal to or greater than efficiency than a, an electrostatic precipitator. A wet scrubber will also be capable of removing toxic chemicals that have uh, that are soluble in water where an electrostatic precipitator is, does not have that capability. And you're sure with about those statements with respect to PM10? I'm not sure I made a statement about PM10. Could you clarify no. that? Okay. The question is I understood you to say that the wet scrubbers were essentially equivalent to ESP. <laughs> Again, the, let me qualify that by saying it depends upon the exact situation that we're talking about. But generally speaking, a state-of-the-art wet scrubber has the capability of controlling particulate matter to a great extent, probably as well as, and in some cases better than, an electrostatic precipitator. Plus, if you are emitting into that if your emission source includes toxic chemicals that have a reasonable water solubility, then the wet scrubber is also going to remove those toxic chemicals, whereas an electrostatic precipitator will not do that. With respect to this specific situation, are those wet scrubbers as efficient? I can't answer that question one way or the other. The biggest single problem that I've had with respect to this matter is getting <laughs> true engineering information so that evaluations like the one you've asked uh, can be answered. It's been extremely difficult to get anything out of South Coast AQMD that is useful and it's been impossible to get anything out of ExxonMobil that's useful with respect to the technical aspects of what we're talking about. I'm assuming you have asked for the information from the district? I've asked for a lot of information from the district. 
let's take a specific example, which is Exhibit 3 that we spent a lot of time talking about today and looking at. Uh, until this, I, until I came here this morning, I didn't even know that table existed. Okay? And secondly, the underlying engineering calculations that created the numbers in that table are a mystery to me. I have no, I, no idea whether or not those numbers have validity or not. And I will never know until I have obtained the engineering calculations and the logic that went in developing those numbers, which is extremely important to the public. And right now they're in the dark, and that's not fair. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Ms. Bird has some questions. Mr. Tarr, on your exhibit that you just handed out, the date is October 12th. Do you have, I mean, excuse me, October 2012. Is there anything that's more current that you? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, so you, or you just have not been able to obtain anything more current, or do you, are you saying that they don't, there's no more current information? Well, the document you're looking at is an EPA document, and essentially it's a compilation of source tests done at a number of FCCUs around the country. Yes, it's dated October 20, 2012, and the information is from October 2011. Okay. Whether or not EPA has attempted to put a compilation like that together since then, I do not know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Any other questions? Thank you for your attention. Um, I'll take this moment to um, identify some other exhibits. We have um, 172 mostly emails from members of the public. We're going to mark those exhibits, public exhibits 5 through 177 um, in the order that they appear in this uh, package. Mr. Tarr's uh, document will be Public Exhibit 178. I have marked it. Oh, I, yeah, I marked that one too. It's P1A. Okay, we have Melanie Cohen, Sally Hayati, and Michelle Livergood. Good afternoon, board. My name is Melanie Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. Um, I can't see very well. I left my reading glasses at home, so if you see a paper stuck in my face, it's because I can't see, and I'm trying to read something. Um, I'm a 25-year resident of the South Bay, a 21-year resident of Redondo Beach, a supporter of Torrance Refinery Action Alliance, a proud auntie, and a pr very protective godmother. I'm also president of the South Bay Parkland Conservancy and a serial volunteer in service to the environment. I humbly ask the hearing board to rule against abatement at this time because those that forget their past are condemned to relive it. The National Chemical Board has not completed its report and has not yet made its uh, recommendations with either the City of Torrance or ExxonMobil, largely because ExxonMobil is not forthcoming with the subpoenas that they have been asked to supply. With that in mind, why should the City of Torrance, its residents, and its surrounding neighbors be subjected to continued unsafe operation that could cause explosions or excessive air pollution that is harmful to all of us until we know the root cause of the explosions. The hearing also should be allowed to be continued because of uh, public and environmental groups' time to review the document that Dr. Ang also brought up. So I hope you do that. The other issue that I have is the startup plan, even with the proposed abatement and mitigation measures, will still result in excess emissions. And they're chemicals, folks. And they hurt children, they hurt older people, and they hurt people with lung disease. My sister's a physician of 32 years in Oregon. She sees this kind of thing all the time. Quickly, I'd like to please also support Mrs. M Ms. Mock's recommendations. Ample event notification by Exxon prior to all emission outbursts and flaring. 
vouchers or reimbursement by Exxon for our relocation and full communication of the reimbursement to area residents, hospitals, and elderly facilities, air quality monitors on the fence line surrounding Exxon Mobil with real-time data, as was done in the Vernon Exide case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Penny Wersing, Joe Galliani, Bruce Gipta. Hello, my name is Penny Wersing. Last name is W-I-R-S-I-N-G, and I did take the oath this morning. I'm a resident and a very active member of the South Bay community. I'm also the manager of the environmental section at the refinery, and I would just like to add my assurance that my staff and all of the employees at the refinery are committed to the safe and timely restart of the refinery, and I encourage the hearing board to uh, approve this abatement order. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Galliani, Bruce Kipta, Robert Ackerman. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Joe Galliani. That's G-A-L-L-I-A-N-I. -L -L -I, I am the organizer of the South Bay Los Angeles 350 Climate Action Group, and I'm here speaking on behalf of that group. I did take the oath. And because I took the oath, I'd like to say from a technical standpoint, our air quality here in the South Bay sucks. We have six refineries, we have two ports, and we have an airport all within a 12-mile circle of where we are right now. And those are the largest sources of stationary air pollution in our state. And right now, we're getting greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions, and pollution shoved down our throats here every minute of every day. And in February, as you may know, the world hit a new record temperature high. Global temperatures never have been as high as they were in February. Scientists are falling all over themselves trying to find words to describe how jaw-dropping and how incredible and how terrible our global temperatures are. Also in the last three weeks, we got news from the fracking industry that the natural gas that we're using is not helping us in terms of our emissions because of the methane that's leaking. And as you know, methane is 20 times more potent than CO2. Also, in the last two weeks, we heard from our nation's preeminent climate scientist, Dr. James Hansen, who told us that the latest studies on sea level rise, which are caused by greenhouse gases warming our atmosphere, are now being accelerated in terms of how much rise we're expecting and how soon that rise is coming. Not by the end of the century, but Dr. Hansen said in the next decades. We already are under mandate in our state by AB 32 to reduce our global warming and reduce our emissions below 1990 levels. And now I stand here at a hearing where we're being asked to increase emissions. And I cannot fathom how when we are so close to the climate precipice that you could possibly give anybody permission to increase emissions here in a place where we're already getting killed with emissions. And when I hear the fine folks here who I empathize with because we all need a good job to pay our family and to pay our bills, but when I hear person after person stand up here and tell me how safe the ExxonMobil refinery is, I wonder wouldn't they have told you that exact same thing the week before it exploded? Wouldn't they have said the same exact thing before the leak they had recently? Wouldn't they have said the same exact thing before a Mylar balloon shut that whole plant down and caused them to flare more toxic chemicals, more emissions into our atmosphere? Where is your line that says enough is enough? At what point does air quality that I breathe here, that we all breathe here, from the Air Quality Management District, at what point does that come, become the preeminent decision here? I've heard a lot of stuff about family, I've heard a lot of stuff about faith, I've heard a lot of stuff about trust me. This is a science issue. Science tells us that the optimal amount of CO2 in our atmosphere to continue civilization as we've known and enjoyed it is 350 parts per million. That's why the organization I work for is called 350.org. <laughs> We're at 403 parts per million right now, and we're climbing a couple every year. So again, I ask you, at what point do you say, no, I'm not going to give you an excuse to increase emissions when we're already over the safety line? I ask you not to give this abatement, and I ask you not to reopen this plant 
until it's actually safe for us to breathe the air that they pump out of that production. Thank you for your time. Bruce uh, Kipta, Robert Ackerman, and the next one is hard to read. It looks like Sue G. Yep, Garnica. Mr. Kipta? Nope. Robert Ackerman? Hello and good afternoon. My name is Robert Ackerman and um, uh, last name is spelled A-C-H-E-R-M-A-N. I have taken the oath. I'm a six-year resident of Torrance and I live about one mile from the refinery. Uh, for background purposes and expertise, I've been involved in three CEQA lawsuits against Los Angeles International Airport. These lawsuits involved, of course, air quality issues including NOx and PM10. Um, I'm here today speaking as a private citizen. I want to thank you for having this meeting today here in our town. And um, I'm speaking in opposition to ExxonMobil's statement uh, or abatement request as submitted. Um, as a counterpoint to what was said today, uh, just because Southern California has not attained federal air conformity um, does not mean that we should continue to allow more pollution or stop striving to reduce air pollution. The problem of air quality conformity is one of the reasons why we were able to settle our first lawsuit against LAX in 2006 um, because they hadn't achieved conformity. As was previously stated, use of air mitigation credits does not help clean the air we breathe uh, around the refinery. And there seem to be two issues that appear to be missing in this abatement request. The first is the fundamental issue of whether or not the root cause of the February 2015 explosion has been resolved. During testimony today, there was nice explanation of the changes Exxon Mobil has made at the refinery, but it does not appear that the explosion risk of keeping hydrocarbons out of the ESP has been fully mitigated and that needs to, to be addressed. The second issue is the storage and use of the hydrofluoric acid um, and these issues must be addressed and documented in writing before the refinery can, can restart. And I haven't seen any of that today. The, the explanations are great but please, please document them. I just want to say that we Torrance residents understand and appreciate the economic importance of the refinery in providing good jobs for our residents and gasoline for our cars. The refinery has been part of our community for many decades and we do want that to continue. However, we neighbors are very concerned about the safety of the refinery. I felt the refinery explosion at my office one mile east of the, of the refinery. It felt like an earthquake and I was expecting that uh, I'd find my debris on my car, but uh, that did not happen. Um, so please, again, please deny this request as submitted and, um, and again, make sure that uh, those safety issues are resolved and uh, before the, the refinery restarts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. My name is Stacy Michaels. Um, that's Michaels with an S. I have not taken the oath, so if you need me to do that, I'd be more than happy to do that. Please, write, please raise your right hand. Do you yes. promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? So I'll be God. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Stacy Michaels, and I'm a longtime resident of the South Bay. Um, I'm elected to represent um, school teachers and the school community from United Teachers of Los Angeles. And I'm also elected to represent um, the California Teachers Association. Um, I, re I represent school communities that are located in East Torrance, and I work in West Carson. And uh, those are the schools that are serviced by Los Angeles Unified School District. My school is located in West Carson. We face in one direction the Exxon Refinery to the west, the Tesoro Refinery to the northeast, the Phillips Refinery to the southeast. We have the 110 freeway, the 405 freeway on either side, and we also have an open air compost facility nearby and a, a sewage treatment facility a few blocks from our school. On a personal note, I've had four sinus surgeries and suffer from adult asthma. And I know I'm very se sensitive to, to pollutants. Um, I'm an adult. I'm not a child. But most of the children that I work with are students of color who, while they're playing on the yard, 
suffer from spontaneous nose, nosebleeds. And by the way, we have a school nurse only once a week. And um, we are bombarded with pollutants in our, um, you know, I'll, I'll see soot on the cars. Uh, our classroom windows are, have sticky gunk on them that falls from the sky. And I have to think about where the wind blows. You know, I know we're not technically West Torrance, but the wind blows in a lot of different directions. You know, we have lockdowns for helicopter chases, but we're not prepared. We're not prepared for an explosion. I'll tell you that right now. They just gave me duct tape, and I haven't even been instructed on how to use it um, in case that we have to bring the children in and shut the doors and, and make sure that none of the outside air comes in. My concern is that you have, studied, you have not studied the full impact, the, the cumulative effect of the pollutants on our health. And I'm asking that you delay the restart with these extensive pollutants, but if you decide to start up anyway, please don't do it while children are at school. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Bassett, Lou Baglietto, Craig Kessler. Hi, I'm Linda Bassett. I'm a resident of Carson on 233rd Street, just down the street by the wind. I didn't take the oath, but I tell you, I'm pretty honest. I'm a teacher. If you want me to take the oath, yes. let's do it. If you want your mm -hmm. testimony on the record. Oh, okay, sure. Evidence, mm -hmm. Raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I so help sure you do. Yes, I Thank do. You. Okay. I just heard uh, my colleague, Stacy Michael, speak on behalf of UTLA, CTA, and the children downwind from Torrance, California. We do not receive any money in taxes from this enterprise here. Okay, so I just want that to be known. I'm a mother and a grandmother of a fabulous five-year-old who lives with me in Carson. And I'm really pissed excuse my French, at the efforts that you're doing here. When you say that you're going to allow 007 microns of gunk of microns to go in the air, those are, I, I think, 007, I think of bullets. Each one of those little microns is a bullet, and you don't know where it's going. You don't know what kid's going to breathe it in. It could be my grandson, and we won't know the effects of that until he's many years older. I could breathe it in and die early and not get to enjoy my grandson. You don't know what you're doing when you allow them this extra. My colleague also just said how much pollutants we're breathing in all the time. I have students in my classroom, too, who live by the refinery down um, off of um, Anaheim. And nosebleeds, headaches, stomach aches, throwing up in the classroom for no reason. You don't have a health expert in here. Did you call in a nurse? Do you know what's going on down in the emergency rooms at night when they allow this to go off? That last Saturday you had that big flare up because a Mylar balloon went there? Why don't they have electric backup. Why did the electricity shut down? I need more time because I br breathed that crap in. You say that he said this refinery has a history of having hydrocarbons get into the ACU. Why don't they get a wet cleaner? They can do that. Um, Cal OSHA found that ExxonMobil hasn't repaired whatever that thing that's, that broke. They didn't repair it since 2011. They don't do due diligence in maintaining this facility. It's 89 years old. They're recalcitrant and they're truculent and I am now too. And you should be too. And don't let me forget Flint, Michigan. You guys may just go down with Flint, Michigan for endangering a whole generation of children with Thank this you. air and asthma. Have you taken the oath, ma'am? No, I have not. Raise your hand, yeah. Mm -hmm. You promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I so do. You got My name is Stephanie Thomas. My dream was to move into Torrance. Unfortunately, you guys have a big problem in Torrance, and that's that oil refinery. Many nights I've woken up, I had to get used to this stuff. The residents have gotten used to the stuff. All these beautiful windows, no one has their windows open. But because I moved into the area and I've developed 
all of these breathing situations. My whole house is on those CPAP machines. We sleep with our window open. And that stuff, we've waken up many of nights. I personally got in the car. My dad was a colonel in the military. And we were trained from him to protect the land. You got a problem up there, and you guys need to check it. That stuff is, 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 is getting away. I don't care how well that they're trained, something is escaping and it's affecting us. Now, if the children were here and they can talk, you would see that in real time. But for somebody who's getting a salary, they will say what they need to say in order to keep a job going. But something is getting away. I have a lung disease, and I'm still having to find someone to go in and investigate where did that come from. I'm, uh, I'm a real person here. I'm not a piece of paper. I'm not something that they forgot to put on paper. And I listened to the presentation earlier. I know my time is going to be running out, but I do not support the reopening. I, I feel that there needs to be further investigation, and I'd like to ask that you get the investigation from the uh, emergency rooms, toxicology reports. There they are. The previous people who, have, who are deceased, those reports are there, and the county coroners, those reports are there. Ma'am, I don't recall if you gave your name. Uh, Stephanie Thomas, resident, six years. And the spelling is the uh, Last spell? name is T-H-O-M-A-S. Thank you. I do apologize, sir. Thank you. Okay, we've come to the end of our public testimony. The board's going to take a uh, short recess, after which we are going to hear closing statements from the parties. The board will then deliberate. But the district is saying that they believe it's beyond the respondents' reasonable control. I mean, I mean not beyond. But the, the respondent has an opportunity themselves to have presented evidence to tell us whether or not, in a variance proceeding, I guess that's because I'm still stuck in this, was this variance, was this order of abatement? So, seven, eight, nine, ten, line, paragraph seven, line seven, the respondent shall notify the public at least 48 hours in advance of its intent to engage in the actions outlined, strike outlined, actions in 7B5-7, then 5 and 7 that I just mentioned are Roman numerals, comma, by placing door hangers on all residents and business businesses within one mile from the electrostatic precipitators, period. That notification shall state that the respondent intends to engage in those activities within 48 hours, comma, and shall also inform the recipient of how to sign up for the, quote, Torrance Alerts Program, period, end quote. Thank you. Ms. Bird, how do you vote? No. Ms. Prusak? I think this is a gray area we have not encountered before, but I regretfully must vote no. Dr. Lee? Yes. Motion passes three, three to two. Nevertheless, there is concern on the part of the public about those excess emissions, and I believe these have been properly addressed today.
Uh, again, I'd like to express my appreciation to the city of Torrance for their hospitality. Uh, and I guess that's it. Anybody else want to make any comment? Thank you very much. The order is issued. Good luck. Hi, good evening. I'm Maureen Mock, um, city council members and staff. I stand before you today as a citizen of Torrance and as one of the South Bay moms. Um, as we are all aware, ExxonMobil's request for abatement was approved last Saturday by a vote of three to two uh, by the Air Quality Management District. There's a good deal of deliberation in deciding whether or not that abatement was, should actually have been a variance. Uh, and in fact, some of those AQMD board members actually said that they felt it was beyond their scope in such a muddied, irregular request. Ultimately, that legal consideration, as you know, was uh, passed. And the deciding vote actually came to the board's health expert, Dr. Clifton Lee, who looked up later was a gynecologist who graduated med school in 1955, who did not utter one word throughout the almost 12 hours of hearing, we, who did not ask one single question of ExxonMobil or the AQMD's plans to help protect the citizens of the South Bay with the restart of the refinery. It became painfully clear that we would be on our own as far as protecting the lungs of our families and our children. And in fact, if it not were not for some members of the South Bay moms that got up and inserted themselves into the wordsmithing of the abatement at literally at the 11th hour, the onus would have been on us for, to check ExxonMobil's website 24 hours ahead of the big six hour unmitigated emissions that they were planning to do. Thankfully, we were able to get Exxon to agree to two days notice and have the six hour startup occur after 7 p.m. when children's sports teams, residents would have the best chance of sheltering in place. But is this really enough? So my question to the council is, what are the leaders of Torrance planning to help mitigate this very dangerous time to be breathing the air anywhere near the refinery? We owe it to the citizens to monitor the air quality, to know the wind direction and communicate those to those residents that will be bombarded by the heaviest doses of toxic particulate. What about the schools? Will they be safe the following morning? Will we send our kids onto those playgrounds where they'll be covered in that particulate, their hands, their clothes, and their mouth and lungs? Should our kids be outside on those days at all? What about the hospitals? Should they not be advised to keep track of the undoubted uptick in respiratory cases, conjunctivitis, nosebleeds, and be ready for treatment? Will there be a medical hotline available? The days are past where we will stand by while companies like ExxonMobil subject people to these injustices just to wait for it literally to blow away. The fact is we know it doesn't blow away. We know that they, w they have found ways to mitigate it. They're cashing in pollution credits. Overall, the course of global air pollution, this will be a drop in the bucket. But us citizens, all of us here, will be breathing it. Those, it's not just those six hours. It's a course of several days. I'm asking the council to form a task force to address these and other considerations. I'd ask for the information concerning the $5 million, $5 million in fines levied by the AQMD that day, where it's been stated that apparently half will go to the South Bay to utilize those funds to, for such the task force to mitigate the environmental and health consequences that Exxon will be subjecting our residents to. I just ask for your consideration and the hope that we can possibly start to communicate to this residents better than what Exxon has offered to do. Thank you. Thank you.